issues, and entertainment. That's local news talk radio for the Monterey Bay, KSCO. Listening to AM 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz. We want to thank you for joining us. You are in for a real treat today. We have a special guest. We're going to talk some fun stuff today about um, about life the way it used to be a long, long time ago here in our neck of the woods. Jack Stein is joining me today. Jack, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Dave. Good. Good to see you. Hey, how, how did your day go? It. Uh, I mean, I kind of already let you. But waking up to people in your home. When when you want to be alone, not a good thing. is one of the most unpleasant feelings in the world. <laughs> All right, um, we're here today. I'm, I'm here with Jack Stein. Jack joining us today is uh, somebody I've been looking forward to hosting. He is a professor up at UCSC. His name is um, Professor Matthew Clapham. Now Matthew Clapham is a professor of paleobiology up at UCSC. He's going to help us. He's going to join us today, and we're going to talk. Um, what are we going to talk about today, uh, Professor Clapham? So, a little bit about the uh, fossils that people might find around the Santa Cruz Bay, something about what life was like here okay. thousands or millions of years ago. What is it, thousands or millions of years ago? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that life changed quite a bit in, in that kind of time, huh? So, there are fossils around the Monterey Bay area that are thousands of years old, but mostly millions of years old, in fact. Millions of years old. Yeah. Okay, so what are some of the fossils that we find? You know, up here near Scotts Valley, you're familiar with Scotts Valley, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, up in Scotts Valley, you can find a bunch of, um, you know, shark's teeth and things like that, correct? Yeah, exactly. A lot of the rocks that are around Monterey Bay area, even up into Scotts Valley and up into the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, were deposited in the ocean millions of years ago. So you find shark teeth, people have found whale fossils, dolphins. Yeah. You know, um, sand dollars, you know, and, and clams and things like that. You know, I found a, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, I, I suspect it's a whale vertebrae out in uh, Nizine Marks, out in, out, in the, um, out in the river out there. It wasn't that far up, but it was, it was, def it was out there, and it definitely look, looks like a, a vertebrae of some sort from a big, giant animal. I'm assuming it was a whale. How high up in, in um, how low is, is the sea level now compared to, to back when these fossils were deposited? Yeah, so it's a, it's a combination of, of the sea level being higher in the past. So, you know, during, during these times, the sea level might have been tens of feet to maybe even, you know, 50 feet higher than it is today. But also, the um, Santa Cruz Mountains are there because the land is getting pushed up by the San Andreas Fault. So it's a combination of what used to be the ocean getting lifted up and, and sea level falling. And that's how we find these fossils up in the, in the mountains, right? Right. You can be, you know, even hundreds or, or you know, there's, there's fossils almost at the top of Loma Prieta. So the, the sea level was not that high. Mm. The land has got pushed up mostly. Okay. So what are some of the most common fossils that we will find uh, around the, the Monterey Bay slash Santa Cruz area? So in, in certain areas, you know, for example, the cliffs around Capitola are, are, are a place where it's very easy to see fossils. There are lots of clam and snail fossils, but also whale and dolphin. I mean, as you, as you might guess, fossils of clams are much more common than, than fossils of whales. Um, up in Scotts Valley, along some of the roads, you can find sand dollar fossils. Um, you know, the fossils of, of vertebrates like whales or dolphins or seals are, are fairly rare. It's unlikely that people are going to find those, but, but they're certainly you know, have been found in many places around here. Um, what exactly is a fossil? Are, are there different types of fossils? Is there only one type? What is a fossil, and how long does it take for these fossils to, to form? I guess it would depend on what type of fossil we're talking about. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's really, it, there's, it's kind of a fuzzy definition. I mean, a fossil is an animal that used to be alive and died and typically got buried you know, in the sand or the mud on the bottom of the ocean or, or a lake or, or a river. Mm -hmm. And then over time, those rocks get lifted up into the mountains and that fossil, you know, that what used to be a teeth, tooth or a bone or a shell will get worn out of the rocks and, you know, get picked up by, by a person looking at them today. 
Mm -hmm. How many different types of fossils are there? Well, I mean, in, in terms of, of how many species, there are, are, you know, hundreds of thousands that have, have been described over, over, you know, the centuries that people have looked at fossils. So many of the common land animals and marine animals today, you know, have fossil records going back millions of years. Really? What, what are some of the marine a animals that we see out there today uh, that were around back in the, in the days when their brothers and their cousins were uh, being right. deposited on the, on the ocean floor for fossils. So, yeah, you know, so many of the species that might be familiar to people today, like gray whales you might see in the bay or, you know, the California sea lion, um, don't have fossils from the, the rocks around here because the rocks are, are, you know, three or five million years old. But there are whale fossils and dolphin fossils that would, you know, the animal that was alive then would look quite similar to, you know, the humpback whale today or, or dolphins today. So, you know, there, there are different species in the way that, you know, the humpback whale and the, and the gray whale are different species, but there are whale and seal and sea lion. Surprisingly, there are walrus fossils here, and, you know, today walruses only live up in, up in Alaska. Right. So. Yeah, you know, I, I, saw, I saw, I was telling my, my uh, co-host here, Jack, I, I have a poster in my house, and it has all these weird animals, everything from ground sloths to, um, I mean, just, just bizarre things, walruses, this type of hippo called apparently a paleoparadoxia. And, and I'm looking at these things, and they used to live here, apparently, mm -hmm. um, or that poster is just a real mean joke. No, they did. The paleoparadoxia, these weird sort of sea cow like things lived here. Um, there was a, a woolly mammoth or part of a woolly mammoth um, found actually at the Buena Vista landfill near, near really? Watsonville. Wow. Yeah. So we had woolly mammoths. What, what other uh, weird critters did we have around here, unsuspected? That we wouldn't so, there, you know, in terms of, of land animals, you know, there's not a lot of, of fossils of them in, in this area, but there likely would have been these, these ground sloths, you know, likely would have been saber-toothed cats. Like, you know, if anyone has been to, down to La Brea, you know, in, in L.A., you know, saber-toothed cats, you know, lion fossils or lion, you know, lions, woolly mammoths, um, those sort of things would have lived in this area, although there's not a huge, there's not a lot of fossil record of them. How about uh, uh, some sort of prehistoric camel? Did I see that correct or no? I mean, yeah, it certainly would. Uh, it would likely have lived here. I don't think there's any fossils of it from this area, but they lived throughout many parts of North America. So it's, there's a very good chance you would have found them, you know, what is now Santa Cruz or Watsonville or Salinas. Mm -hmm. um, I was asking uh, my, my co-host here, Jack, about the uh, short-faced bear and I'm sorry to be throwing all this stuff at you, but I'm just so excited, man. I, yeah. I, this is just, just so fun, and I want people to have fun while we're talking to you because th this stuff is exciting. Uh, your classes must be full. Your, your classes must be packed <laughs> with, with people trying to, to learn this stuff. It's really, yeah, I mean, just to think that maybe even 10,000 years ago, you know, so, so nowadays, you know, in California, in most places, you know, we don't really have any large animals anymore. You know, if you go to the Sierras, you can see some black bears. You know, here we have mountain lions and lots of deer, but there's nothing like, you know, elephant size, like the woolly mammoth or none of these big carnivores like short faced bears or, or anything like that. But, but, you know, 10 or 15,000 years ago, there would have been a whole bunch of these things, camels, short faced bears, woolly mammoths. Um, and, and so the, the ecosystems and the animals that, you know, people even would have seen when they, you know, you're, you know, the Spanish or the would have seen when they first got here in the, you know, 1700s would have been completely different from what sort of historically was living here. Wow, that that is so bizarre. That is unbelievable. So what caused uh, the extinction of these various species of animals? I mean, what, it, was it climate change? Was it um, uh, uh, humans causing change in, in the environment? What, what, what was it? Yeah, there, there's, still, there's still some debate about this, but it's, it seems like, you know, because... Certainly, you know, there has been a lot of climate change from, you know, there was an ice age and then it ended. Mm -hmm. And, but these animals went extinct at different times in different places. And the times that they disappeared pretty much line up with the times that humans got to those places. So, you know, mm -hmm. 15,000 years ago, humans are first uh, reaching North America. And then within a few thousand years, pretty much all these large animals go extinct. 
Um, so it seems like whether it's human hunting or whether it's humans, you know, many large animals don't like to be around humans. Mm-hmm. You know, and so maybe it's just the animals are getting pushed into smaller and smaller areas because of where humans are living, whether it's because humans are, you know, clearing forests with fire. Um, but it seems like humans are, are, are largely responsible for why many continents no longer have these, these large animals. I know uh, when, when I was speaking with my co-host about the, the short-faced bear, I'm going to uh, ask you about this. Um, he mentioned that, that the, these types of animals changed human migration patterns for one reason or another. Maybe it changed them because they wanted to hunt them. Maybe it changed the, the migration patterns because they were scared of these things. But how, how often did these animals uh, affect uh, human life, migration, uh, everyday life, right. that, that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. It's something that's hard to directly tell with fossils, but you could certainly imagine that that humans and and bears would be wanting to hunt the same things. Mm-hmm. You know, so there would be some some competition where we might want to avoid the bears so that we could then hunt deer instead of. And obviously, you know, for our you know for early humans coming to North America, they might have you know bears might have tried to eat them as well. And so certainly you would um, imagine that people would have. You know, try to avoid some of these these carnivorous animals like bears or or lions or or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, let's start off with. Um, I'm looking here at some of the um, some of the courses that you teach. You teach the history of life, which it says here is an examination of major events in the history of life from the origin of life, approximately four billion years ago, to the wave of extinctions that has decimated plants and animals around the globe for over the past thirty thousand years. Um, well, this is one of the courses that you teach. How many courses do you teach up there at UCSC? So, yeah, that's, that's, that's one that I teach uh, largely for sort of non-science majors or mm-hmm. for anyone who's interested in fossils. I teach th- mainly th- three other courses that are, are sort of more specialized ones for, for science majors in the earth sciences. One about invertebrate fossils, which is kind of so that's my area of research. So fossils of clams and, you know, crustaceans and things like that that typically live in the ocean. I teach a class on sort of data analysis and statistics, which is, you know, a very sort of sort of programming type class. And then one on sort of how when you look at rocks, sediment, sedimentary rocks, ones that formed in rivers or in the ocean, you know, how can you tell where those formed, you know, on a beach or in the deep ocean? And, and how does um, sea level change over time affect the pattern of, of those rocks? And so that's a sort of a subject that's... Um, you know, a, a very sort of traditional geology subject. So in order for something to become a fossil, like if I wanted to become a fossil, mm-hmm. would I, is that going to happen if I get buried in, in the dirt? Do I have to go and lay in a river? Or do I go out in the desert? Do I bury myself in a mountain? How do I right. become a fossil? Certainly, you know, getting, getting your body underground is, is, a, is like the first important step for becoming a fossil. And it doesn't have to be that far underground. Getting, um, being in the ocean is much better than being on land um, because on, on land, you know, um, it tends to be that, you know, rivers will come in and will then maybe dig your body up because as rivers cut through the landscape, they might, your body, you know, might get brought back up to the surface where scavengers will eat it and the, <laughs> the rain will break right. it down and everything. So, so, yeah, so getting yourself, um, you know, getting yourself buried in, in, in the ocean floor is is sort of the the best shot that you're going to have to become a fossil. And then how long do I have to wait to show my mom, hey, look, I'm a fossil? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you have to wait for the sort of the sand and the mud to slowly accumulate on top of you, and then that means that it'll, everything will get sort of compressed together, and water will sort of turn your bones into, into rock, hopefully. Um, you know, that process probably takes, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of years but then the process to sort of bring you back up to the surface where people can find you often takes millions of years for for that to happen yeah i don't have that much time dr right Clapham. yes I don't yeah, have... so all, all your friends will be long gone by the time your your <laughs> fossil is back so it won't be there will be nobody to impress right <laughs> no women i can't impress the women can't impress my mom can't impress anybody because they're all right. dead yeah. Not a good plan. Uh, what can be determined from a fossil? What, what can we tell from a fossil? That, that Let's just say I'm out there in, um, in my backyard gardening and I find a shark's tooth or I find something. The average person goes out there out in, in, uh, out in nature and they find a fossil. What can you tell? What's some of the things you should look for? 
Right. Well, I mean, many of the fossils that, that people might find around here will be fairly familiar. I mean, a, a shark's tooth from you know, then looks more or less like shark teeth today. The clams that you would see as fossils then are, are quite similar looking to the clams you might see today. Um, and how, you know, old, how old are those the clam fossils or the shark's tooth fossils? How old is well, that thing that I'm holding? So up in, up in Scotts Valley where, where people can find shark t- shark's teeth, um, you know, those things are on the order of 10 or 12 million years old. So they're, they're, in terms of geological time, that's actually fairly young. But in terms of, of human time, that's a really, really old, old fossil. You know. Wow. Uh, 479 is the number to call in. We are speaking with Dr. Matthew Clapham. He's a, a professor up at uh, UCSC. Um, professor, is there any information you want to give on, on the courses of how we can sign up, when, when to sign up for these courses? Uh, well, I mean, we pretty much offer sort of one every academic quarter here. The History of Life one is, is I mean, that's a fun course to teach because it, as it's sort of the name suggests, I get to talk about all the cool things sort of through the history of life, you know, big, you know, big mass extinction events like when the dinosaurs died and, right. and cool evolutionary things like how birds evolved. And so that's, that's a really fun one for, for me as well. I really enjoy that class. Right. That, that, that's where I want to start off when we get uh, back from the break because we got to go to a break here. We're going to be um, about a seven or eight minute break, uh, Dr. Clapham. So if you want to get up and spread your wings around, mm-hmm. just, you know, uh, walk around a little bit. Uh, we'll be back in about seven or eight minutes and, uh, and we'll pick up this interview on the other side. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Dr. Clapham is joining us. He's a professor up at UCSC. If you have any questions, you can give us a call. We'll get to them uh, when we can. Otherwise, you can send a text message or D, uh, or a email to dm at ksco.com, and we'll relay to them uh, that way. KSEO Santa Cruz, 431 is the time. Jack, how am I doing? Do I sound like a fool yet? No, you sound great, man. All right. You sound good, great. Good. Great. Jack's here to help me out. He's going to make sure that we ask good, productive, smart questions. Uh, since we have the professor here, we don't want to waste our time, your time. We're going to have a lot of fun. Keep it tuned in. KSEO Santa Cruz. KSEO Radio News is up next. From Capitola to Carmel, Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSEO Santa Cruz. Seven nine one zero eight zero. You're listening to Flight 1080 KSO Santa Cruz. That is the phone number. Eight three one is the area code. Two one eight five seven two six with your text messages. If you want to send in a message instead of making a phone call, you can send a text message. Two one eight five seven two six. Email dm at kso.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and like. I am here with my co-host, Jack Stein. Joining us today, Jack, is Professor Matthew Clapham. He is a professor up at UCS. He teaches a bunch of courses up there, and I am excited, as you could probably tell, um, because I don't stop to breathe. I just keep talking, blah, 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 blah. I don't uh, stop to breathe. <laughs> uh, professor, I have a question for you, if you're, if you're willing to take it. Go for it. So um, I, uh, I have a degree in anthropology. I studied primates for a long time. I worked with primates for a long time. Uh, you know, people kind of get it. They go like, oh, yeah, monkeys, apes, I get it. I know why a person would want to work with that. Why would you want to work with um, invertebrates? It's really very interesting to me that that would be the focus of your, of your work. Right, yeah, clam, clams and snails are not quite as exciting as, as dinosaurs or, or, or even, even primates. Yeah. Um, I'm more interested in, in the questions you can answer with this. You know, some of the things that I study are, are mass extinctions where, you know, many, many species, you know, all died in a fairly short time. And I'm interested in, in sort of why some things survive and why some things didn't. And particularly if you look at these mass extinctions in the past, which were caused in some cases by, you know, very rapid warming of the ocean, you know, and potentially ocean acidification, you can, by understanding what happened in the past, maybe help understand what might happen in the future as the oceans get warmer and, and more acidic today. So when, you, um, when you're teaching a course in this, I, it's one of the things that I, w- I, I went to UCSC. I was, uh, I'm an alum of, mm-hmm. of the fine halls of UCSC. <laughs> Do you find that um, students are concerned about the relevance today based on the information that they receive about climate change and all that? Is that kind of an, a, a point of interest amongst the student body? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And also, I mean, fossils, even if they're of clams and snails, are still kind of fun. So I think that students are, are, are interested in, in that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also, you know, when you're working back in, you know, millions of years ago, there's a lot of sort of puzzle solving, right? We have, you know, it's not quite as easy to answer some of these questions as if you're working you know, today when we have lots and lots of information about where species live and how many species there are and, you know, where, what types of animals are in different places. In, you know, back in the, in the fossil record, it's a lot, it's a, we have a lot less information and so you sometimes have to, there's a lot of, of sort of fun puzzles to solve. You have to think creatively about, about how to answer these questions. I actually, um, I was trying to explain uh, strata layers to a, a friend of mine and this is years ago, and he said, well, how do you know, how do you know that something existed at a certain point in time? He said, how do you do the math on that? Right. And I, I told him, I said, well, imagine if you will, you come up to my clothes hamper, and I've got pants and shirts and sweaters in there, and you take out a sweater, and you look in the pockets, and there's nothing in there, and then you come across a pair of pants, and you got a movie ticket in there, and it says that I saw a movie on a Thursday. Well, we could safely assume then that the sweater that was on top of the pants I wore on a Friday. Right. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great analogy. You know, in, in all these cases, we have like layers of, of rocks now, sand or sandstone or, or whatever mud that were deposited on the ocean floor a long time ago. And, and those layers build up slowly at, time over time. And so we know that, you know, if a layer is below it's older, and if it's on top, it's younger. But then we have to figure out, as you were sort of with your movie ticket, like, well, how long ago was it actually? So that's where we have to look for places where you have sort of layers of, of sediment, you know, sand and mud from the ocean floor, but also maybe a volcano goes off, and you get a thin layer from the volcano, and that will contain small crystals that we can actually measure the chemical composition of, you know, measure the, 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 the elements in them to figure out how many millions of years ago that actually was. And so it's this process of taking this relative scale where we know that, okay, well, this happened first, and then this happened, and then this happened, and finding these little layers where you can tie it all together into the, the absolute scale. Is there, um, is there an extinction event that you find to be the most fascinating or the most, um, the most rich yeah, and they, they all have their own little quirks. And, you know, the, the one at the end of the Cretaceous period is probably, perhaps the most famous because, you know, it killed off all the dinosaurs. And so, you know, we all, that's what the comics are about. You see uh, the cartoons, are, everyone knows about that one. It's not the biggest one, actually. It's sort of the, kills off a very charismatic group. But there's an extinction earlier, about 250 million years ago, at the end of a time period called the Permian uh, and that's one that I studied a lot, so I, I find that very interesting. It's the biggest of all time. Um, it, it had really important consequences. I mean, part of the reason that today you see a lot of clams and snails on the beach is because of that extinction 250 million years ago, which wiped out many of the things that used to be common and kind of made space for these for clams that used to be rare to take over. The Permian also resulted in an ice age, right? That was the, if I can go back into my anthro brain. <laughs> yeah, so there, there was, a, there was an, an ice age sort of in the early, throughout the early part of the Permian, and it sort of it ended, and then, then you know, a little bit later on, you got this, this mass extinction. But there was a lot of really interesting sort of um, environmental changes throughout the whole time period that, that I find very fascinating. So, I mean, one of the things, uh, again, going way back, because I haven't studied this in years, but when I go back into my, my brain, it, it seems most extinction events occur due to uh, very rapid environmental change. And almost always it's caused by uh, warming and or cooling at an accelerated rate. That's right. Yeah, I mean, species are always coming and going. You know, there's always species that are going extinct but at, at a very low level, to get one of these mass extinctions where you kill off 50 or 75 or even 90 percent of all the species that were alive at that time takes something pretty dramatic. And, and those are often very rapid warming and events that are accompanied by the oceans becoming more acidic. The one at the end of the Cretaceous is sort of famous because it was an asteroid impact, you know, a big 
you know, 10, you know, six mile wide asteroid smashes into the earth and, and causes all, you know, creates all this havoc. So it takes something pretty dramatic to cause a mass extinction. And so that's why they, they don't happen that often. So I've actually read about that particular asteroid impact. They're conflicting, may, maybe of more insight into this, but some people say it was for sure in the Gulf of Mexico. And then other people say, well, it was for sure where the Aleutian Islands are now. And then other people say, well, it was for sure just outside of Japan. So do you have any insight into this? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some debate about this extinction. I think that the, the crater, you know, has been, I think, fairly confidently found in, in Mexico now, you know, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, really around the Caribbean, there are some really spectacular um, rock deposits that were stuff that was thrown out of this crater. It's really, it's really quite amazing. I've never been to them. I've seen photos. Um, but there's some debate with this extinction because around the same time as this asteroid impact, there was also these, this sort of climate change event as well. And so people have debated, like, well, was it climate change? Was it, was it the climate getting warmer quickly? Or was it this asteroid impact? Or was it both? It seems like the asteroid impact is the most likely explanation here. Um, but, but again, you know, with, with these ancient events, there's, you know, you have to, they, they can be, they can be a little difficult to reconstruct something that happened so many millions of years ago. Four seven nine one zero eight zero. We are here with Doctor or Professor Matthew Clapham. He is a professor up at UCSU. If you have any questions, get them to us, and we will relay them. Or you can give them a call. Uh, give us a call at four seven nine one zero eight zero. We have a couple phone calls. So let's get to those, uh, Professor. First of all, are you willing to take phone calls? Absolutely. All right. Let's get out to Aptos and pick up Steve. Let me make sure uh, Professor Clapham is locked in. Yes, Steve, you are in the air, sir. Thank you for your call. Yeah, Dr. Clapham, uh, 300 miles to the south, we have L.A., and they have the tar pits down there. Have you been there? I have, yes. And they have the tar pit museum. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is. And they show, like, a willy mammoth, the tusk 13 feet long, camels, uh Grizzly bears bigger than the Alaskan grizzly bears, saber-toothed ti tiger, lion, like the lion in Africa, a gopher the size of 400 pounds. What? Uh, it just goes on and on. And all these things uh, they pulled out of the tar pit there. And uh, evidently it was one heck of a forest and jungle, and then all of a sudden they're all gone. That's right, yeah. Um, uh, uh, thank you for your call, Steve. Four seven nine ten eighty. What did what did the um, what did this environment look like back when the sharks' tooth uh, sharks' teeth were being deposited in uh, in Scotts Valley on on the ocean floor that would eventually become Scotts Valley? What, right. what was the um, environment like? Uh, uh, here we would be underwater, but what was it like further up in the mountains? Right. Um, it's actually a good question. Uh, you know, it it likely would have been. I think it, was, it would have been probably a little wetter than it is today it was warmer than today you know by probably a couple degrees because carbon dioxide levels at that time were slightly higher than they are right now um and so and also at that time scott's valley was located much further to the south because of the san andreas fault the little slice that's sort of Monterey and Scotts Valley, you know, the Santa Cruz Mountains has been going north as uh, instead of been going south. So, in fact, Scotts Valley would have been probably, you know, very close to Bakersfield at the time as they've been as it's been moving up north since then. Two one eight five seven two six. Somebody uh, texts me. They they want to know: Do you go fossil hunting? I do. I mean, not uh, a little bit locally. I've collected some sand dollars here, and I've got some of the the. The, the clam fossils you can find in, in my yard. For my research, I've done field work in a, in a variety of places to, to collect fossils to understand these sort of how ancient climate change events and how ancient mass extinctions affect marine organisms. Four seven nine ten eighty two one eight five seven two six. What are what are the legal ramifications for, for taking these fossils from wherever you discover them? So you know if you find if if it's on private land and you own that land or you have permission, you can do whatever you want. If it's on public land, like state-owned or federal government-owned land, you're allowed to collect fossils of invertebrates like clams or snails or 
you know, sand dollars or corals or whatever. But for vertebrate fossils, like for whales or dinosaurs or whatever, you need a, you need a permit to collect those. Um, but, but if you want to go out fossil hunting, the Santa Cruz area is maybe not the, not the greatest because there's not a lot of sort of accessible locations to do it in. You know, many of the, many of the sand quarries in say Scotts Valley are, are either active quarries, which you can't go into, or they're shut down and are privately owned. And so it's hard to get to them. But mm-hmm. if, if people, you know, so certainly if anyone you know, happens to be on vacation in the West of the U S like Nevada is a great place, you know, because so much of it is just federal government land, and so it's our it's you know land owned by all of us essentially, and so you can collect fossils there if you want or other places. Hmm. All right, interesting. Um, now here it says you you teach one of the courses you teach is the history of life. Um, let's start there. You know, what is the history of life? It's it, it started about four billion years ago. When did the first uh, um, invertebrates that you, that you study? When did they start popping onto the scene and start? Right, so, so the history of life, you know, when most people think of fossils, they'll think of, you know, dinosaurs or, or, or maybe, you know, trilobites or ammonites, these sort of invertebrates. But, in fact, almost virtually, you know, the 75 or more percent, you know, actually more like 85 percent of the history of life is single-celled things. So, so, you know, microscopic life had been around for a long time, you know, maybe – maybe three and a half, maybe four billion years ago, maybe even more on, on Earth. So Earth is about four and a half billion years old, and there's very little known about the early part. But there was at least three billion years of essentially nothing but single-celled creatures, and then multicellular life, most starting with invertebrates, appeared around 550 or 600 million years ago. So we've had about a bit over 500 million years of fossils that you can actually see if you're looking at rocks. Interesting. Um, 479-1080-218-5726. Um, what would you say to people who, who, who uh, you know, I, I interview people who are, who are religious, and they will say that um, the, the earth is not anywhere near that old. How, um, how, how uh, trusting can you be? How accurate? Are, are the tests, the, 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 the way you... For, how, how do you test the age of something? Let's start right. there. Right, right. So, so the age, you know, so people might have heard of carbon dating, which you can use on, like, archaeological things mm-hmm. or, or, or things like that. And so that uses, um, you know, when one element decays, you know, changes into a different element because of radioactive decay, you can, you can measure that. Now, carbon dating only works for things that are, are very young geologically. Maybe you can go back 50 or 60,000 years only with carbon dating. But there are other um, crystals that have things like uranium in it, you know, very small amounts of uranium. And if you find those tiny crystals, you can actually measure so how much uranium has turned into lead, which is what it becomes over time. And we know from, measure, you know, from physics and, and measurements in the lab sort of how fast that happens. You can measure how much was there originally by looking at different types of uranium and then figure out you know, how old that material was. And in fact, what we know about the age of the Earth doesn't come from the Earth at all. It comes from asteroids because the oldest Earth material that we have is about 4.2 or 4.3 billion years old. These are these tiny little crystals. But we have asteroids, you know, meteorites that have been collected on Earth that are 4.6 billion years old. And because of the way that people know solar systems form, we know that the Earth must have formed at the same time. And we know also how old the moon is. And so, in fact, you know, the, the early, the first 500 or 700 million years of the Earth, there's basically nothing of that material left. It's all been sort of broken down and melted and remade into different rocks. Wow, man, that is. Uh, so you say up until about 500 million years ago, there was there was a bunch of um, um, single cell life, right? Mm-hmm. Are there any fossils of that? Yeah, in fact, there are. It seems it seems surprising that like, wait, how how are there going to be you know single celled things like bacteria that get fossilized? And it is very rare, as you as you might imagine. I mean, these things don't have teeth or bones or shells or, or whatever. Um, but they they sort of fossilize in these in these sort of very specific types of rock that, that almost, so it's a rock type that's called chert. And 
people who want to see chert, if you're ever in the Marin Headlands, most of the, the red layers there are a rock called chert. And it's a, it's a, it's a rock that sort of forms on the seafloor from sort of, the, it gets it, like the seawater, materials from the seawater turn into this rock kind of on the seafloor and it happens really quickly. And so that's how you can fossilize, you know, bacteria and, and other single-celled things, you know, single-celled, you know, plants and, and, and whatnot. Um, okay, I'm going to throw you another weird one, like my, how do I fossilize myself? You ready for this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have seen pictures from, um, I'm just going to say it, I'm just going to say it, from Mars, right? It's supposedly from Mars, that show what some people say are fossilized bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen these? What are your thoughts on this? If you if you have or haven't seen it, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that that made a big splash back in the the mid nineties, I yes, guess, yes. when when they were found. And 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 yes, yeah, so it was it was very exciting at the time. But as as people have looked at them more, uh, I, I think you know the the general feeling is that those are probably not bacteria fossils. No. I think that they're too small, if I remember, at least compared to bacteria on Earth. You know, it's hard. You know, sort of we sort of think. Or people think they know how small you can make a cell and still have all the things it needs to to live, you know. But certainly, you know, this this field of as you call it, astrobiology, like what would life look like on other planets? We only know about life on Earth, and so we have to, for lack of anything better, use Earth as our model of what life does. But for all we know, life could be very different on on other planets. How, if there is life. You how, know. how resilient is life? I mean, is it possible that a, an asteroid could have, the same asteroid that could have uh, wiped out the dinosaurs, is it possible that that could have knocked out debris containing bacteria, containing, uh, I, I don't know, some, sort, some form of life, <laughs> sent it out into the universe, and that takes off and seeds the next planet, wherever it happens to be? Is life that resilient? Could it make it that, through that kind of journey? It, it possibly could. I mean, bacteria and, you know, single-celled things, can withstand a lot. Um, and so, you know, it would be, you know, it would be unlikely, but if it, you know, but if sort of enough pieces got thrown out, maybe one of them, you know, maybe bacteria, one of them could survive. I mean, it's not, it's not out of the realm of possibility at least, but, you know, it's a harsh environment. It had to sort of sort of sit dormant for probably millions of years before they landed somewhere else. Could so, they live, th could they live that long? Well, you know, some, some, um, it's an question. I mean, some some single-celled things can sort of go into kind of like hibernation almost. They can turn themselves into like a little, um, you know, sort of sort of hunker down and 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 last for a long time. Mm -hmm. Whether it could be millions of years, there's a lot of radiation in space. You know, where if they're inside the rock, it could protect them a little bit. But I mean, it would take a lot of things to go right for that to happen. But it's the one thing which which I think you know sort of evolution in the fossil record tell us is that if you have billions of years, that's an enormously long time. And so even if this thing happens, you know, once in every billion years, it would have happened four times over the Earth's history. So, you know, time is, is sort of the great equalizer in all of this. It can really um, make a lot of things possible, even if that thing is extremely unlikely. Have you ever seen uh, sea monkeys, Dr. Uh, Professor? Oh, yeah. Putnam? Yes, right. So they... That's kind of the idea. They have this like little hard, you know, sort of egg case that can last for long times right. in really stressful environments. Yeah. Right. What are those things? I I don't know what they are. Do you know Do you know what they are? Yeah. So so they're not monkeys. Yes. They're 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 little <laughs> crustaceans. Um. Yeah. So so they're crustaceans. They're like you know they're related to the crabs or 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 shrimp or lobsters. Right. Um. Different sort of crustacean. Is that is that unusual? Is is that an unusual talent for for um a crustacean? Yeah, I mean, like they, 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 are, they are unusually tough for, for animals. You know, most animals, you know, I mean, need water, especially, if, especially animals that live in the o ocean or even animals that live on land. They need to be kept moist, you know, f because to get oxygen from the air or the water into your body, it needs to happen across something that's wet. And so that's why, so our, you know, our lungs are pretty moist inside. And for animals that live in the ocean, well, they don't really have this problem because it's wet everywhere. Okay, so now for uh, people who like to go fossil hunting, or even if you just walk along the shores, uh, certainly here in Santa Cruz, you're going to see a ton of, those, those are fossils, right? Those, those are clamshells, those are fossils, the, the little holes in, in the rocks, are those from like um, oysters or clams poking through, through rock, through sediment? So, so yeah, certainly, you know, you'll see um, 
you know, holes in rock or holes in, in driftwood sometimes, right. um, you know, and, and those are from clams. Yeah. Uh, and so clams can actually, there are certain clams that will, by sort of scraping their shell around, will, will slowly, you know, create this, this hole in the rock, which they actually live in. Um, and so sometimes, you know, if you, there might be a, a shell still in there. Those are probably from, from sort of living or, or recently dead shells. So uh, they probably wouldn't, you know, the ones you find on the beach or, or you know that you might find in in, in the rock there's still shells or perhaps not fossils they could be several hundred years old or maybe several thousand years old even shells on the beach uh we, we are speaking with professor matthew clapham he is a, a uh, he teaches up at the university you're going to hang out with us for another uh, up until six right professor yep, sure okay good so we are going to break that's a, enough time to get up and and take a walk around or get a breather or get a glass of water or whatever and uh, and we'll be back on uh, on the other side of the break Great. You're listening to KSCO, serving Moss Landing, Marina, and Piscinas. You're listening to AM 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz. I'm here with Jack Stein today. Joining us, Jack, is uh, Professor Matthew Clapham. He is a professor up at UCSC, University of California, Santa Cruz. And I want to thank uh, Professor Clapham again for joining us um, today. Uh, Professor Clapham, are you there? Yes. Okay, good, yeah. good, good. Jack, thank you for helping me out, dude. I, I'm oh, totally yeah. relying on, on you asking some uh, some questions as well. So let's start off with... Um, let's start off... Where, where do we leave off? We left off with... Um, invertebrate right um fossils on mars that apparently being being nothing to to get excited about uh t professor can i do you know anything about megafauna can i ask some questions about that sure yeah so i read it has got to be years ago that that someone was kind of taking the position that that we needed megafauna uh in in the united states because they had they 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 served a certain role within the trophic sphere. And now that megafauna are gone, they were actually trying to, to say that, well, this is why we have such increased weather conditions because we don't have these mega animals around anymore. And, and that was basically their, their position was that, that a, a key part of the trophic or nutritional plane had been removed or, or you know, now that it's removed, that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. So I was curious what you thought about that. Yeah, it's certainly certainly true that you know the the ecosystems in North America up to ten thousand years ago had many you know elephant sized species you know mammoths, mastodons, all sorts of stuff like that, and they actually would have played an important role in in the food chain. There are, are certain plants like avocados, for example. Their their pits are huge, right? Maybe, I'm sure many people have eaten avocados and they have these giant pits to get to make a new avocado tree, that pit basically would need to go through the gut of an animal and then, you know, into the ground to make a new tree. But there's no animals alive today that could eat it. So it must have been like giant ground sloths or mammoths or whatever that used to eat these things. And so if it wasn't for humans, avocados would go extinct. But wow. so, and there's other plants in North America, in Eastern North America, that have these like really large seeds that nothing eats now, and they must have been spread and dispersed by megafauna before. It probably didn't affect the. Cl it probably wouldn't have huge effects on like the weather or the climate. But in terms of of like, you know, the landscapes, you know, whether there's forests or, or grasslands, there would be some effect. You know, as as large animals tend to, you know, if they're grazers, they'll prevent trees from growing essentially. Uh, I also wanted to, this may seem like way off base, but I was running by the levee today, um, and uh, I was thinking that this whole area, uh, you know, Santa Cruz, right as we go into the, the ocean, this was all part of a massive floodplain at one point in time. And I'd be curious to know if you have any thoughts on what it means to kind of reroute a river and what effect that might have in terms of a floodplain and... and um, fossils and things of that nature. Right. Yeah, I mean, in many places, not just Santa Cruz, you know, we've artificially put rivers into channels so they don't flood our buildings anymore. And, and 
I mean, that's good for, for human infrastructure and for human societies, but it does affect, um, you know, the, the, the nutrients. In many places, these floodplains rely on flooding to bring new soil and to replenish the, you know, the nutrients in, in the soil. And in some places, not so much in, around here because the land is rising up, but in, in places like Louisiana, because the Mississippi River is, is in this channel, the land is sinking because there's no longer, no, no longer new sand and mud being distributed by, by flooding every, every year or a couple of years. Four seven nine one zero eight zero two one eight five seven two six dm at ksco.com. Um, Professor Clapham, what questions can we ask from, from uh, finding a fossil? Now, now I, I know we could find answers, but w if I look at a fossil, what kind of questions do, you, do, do scientists come up with? I mean, here, here's, I don't know what this thing is. It's, it's a rock, right? And, well, no, it's a fossil. What questions um, can, can be asked and answered by, by finding a fossil? Right. So, you know, I mean, some of the things that fossils can tell us is, is where different animals used to live. And in some cases, animals, um, you know, are sensitive to temperature. You know, for example, turtles or, or crocodiles, you know, only live in places that are fairly warm. And so if you find crocodile fossils at, you know, up in the Arctic, it can tell you, that, like, wow, it must have been a lot warmer here in, in the past. Um, so that's something, that, you know, just from a single fossil, you know, it can give you some information if it's the right type of animal about climate or, you know, it can tell you, did this area used to be underwater or did it used to be on land? Um, you know, and, and so they also tell us about, about evolution, you know, how the living species that we see today got here. You know, what were the ancestors of those, of these animals and plants um, like in the past and, and how did they come to be like they are today? Are there any fossils I'm going to find out there walking around the, you know, Santa Cruz, the, the cliffs or anything uh, like that? Am I going to find any animals that are no longer around today? Yeah, so, so in, in a couple of ways. So, so some of, you know, just right by the lighthouse in, in Santa Cruz, there was a fossil of a walrus found. So it's not the same walrus that lives up in Alaska today. It would have looked a little different. Wow. But those don't live around here. And then there are also around here, there are fossils of, of, of relatives of the sea cow that like only lives in the Caribbean today. And also there are things that are, that are completely, don't even have any relatives today that are completely extinct. Any examples? Well, there's this group called the Desmostylians, and they would have looked kind of like a weird sea cow, but with sort of four legs instead of flippers and with sort of short faces. Yeah. So they, they, they are somewhat related to sea cows, but they are a complete, you know, they were their own group and they went extinct, you know, a few million years ago probably. And, and Well, they sound pretty gross. That, that sounds... <laughs> Kind they look a little. They look a little weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is an invertebrate? And that that that's what you study, right? You study fossils of invertebrate mostly. Yes. Yes. So so invertebrates are, are animals without backbones. So in fact, most animals are invertebrates. So insects are invertebrates. Clams mm -hmm. or snails. You know, they might have shells like on the outside, like mm -hmm. a clam does, but they don't have a backbone like we do, or like other mammals do, or birds, or or things like that. Are there any? Um are there any invertebrates uh, invertebrates going extinct now? Uh, are we watching the uh, extinction of any in, anything that we can recognize? So there, there, there almost certainly are, but we don't really know much about them because most of the you know conservation work there's there's very little conservation work done on fossil uh, on, on on living clams, for example. Um, one one invertebrate group that we that people do think is 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 quite at risk at least are corals. You know corals. Um, you know, that make all these nice reefs if you go to the tropics, um, really don't respond well to oceans getting hotter and more acidic. And this is something that we can tell from looking at fossil corals, that every time there's an event like this where the oceans warm up quickly, it's, a bad, it's bad news for coral reefs. And so today, even today, corals have these bleaching events where like a whole bunch of the reef will die because it gets too hot. So they're perhaps one of the groups of invertebrates that it, it's at greatest risk. But in terms of, of species, you know, we, especially of marine invertebrates, there's really not much known about 
which ones are going extinct because there's not enough study of, of the living ones. Interesting, interesting. Uh, 479 let's get to some more phone calls. Uh, Dave is up next. He's calling from Salinas. Dave, thank you for your call. You're in the air. Yeah, good evening, guys. My throat's kind of screwed up a little bit. But, you know, I'm, I'm hitting close to 60 years old, and uh, I used to do a lot of stuff way out in the valley, Karma Valley, and I could still show you places that we could dig in chalk rock, and we spend, I don't know, most of the day just tanning ourselves, but busting these rocks up, and we'd find all kinds of fossils. And I got a story about one in San Carlos Ranch that the caretaker had a couple daughters. <laughs> Boy, were they wild. Anyway, um, this is before the ranch got swapped over, and she was waylaid on her uh, rent, and she had this beautiful fossil on the fireplace that was of a fish. It was about two feet long, and it ended up being millions of years old. And he goes, well, I'll take that for your rent. <laughs> and she jumped on it and said, yeah, sure, I owe this money for rent, but you can have this. Turns out the fossil is worth millions of dollars. But we would find all kinds of clamshells, leaves, worms. I mean, I know a lot of places you can go and bust up chalk rock if you have the time and sit there and want to play with them and guaranteed we knew what layers there were you know the dark layers that were too soft weren't that good the harder the chalk rock is the better the fossil was so it was a lot of fun to do when you're a kid oh interesting thank you for the call dave four seven nine one zero eight zero. i would imagine professor clapham that that's kind of how the first uh paleontologists got their start right just goofing around with rocks splitting them open noticing the difference in uh, the hardness of them and, and uh, maybe the, the fossil content in the layers? Yeah, I mean, certainly when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, I loved fossil collecting and, you know, it, it's kind of what got me into the, into the field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, historically, you know, the, the discipline of paleontology, you know, developed because of people, you know, finding especially bones of these weird things, like what are these crazy bones and, and teeth? And, you know, for people in, in like the 1700s or the 1800s, it was, you know, for sort of academic paleontology, at least it was, they knew that there was nothing like this at all today. And so it was, a, it was an area of, of quite a lot of interest. Uh, DM at KSEO.com, um, Professor Clapham, someone sent me a, a picture and I, and I forwarded it to you. They wanted to know what the heck this thing was that they had and you suggested that's probably a mammoth tooth. That thing is huge. So, yeah, so mammoths and, and elephants today have these big, long, like, ro teeth rows that are sort of yeah. one giant block. They'd be like, you know, more than a foot long that are sort of their, their molar teeth, you know, like in the back of their jaw where they grind down all the plants. And, and you know, this is not, you know, as I said, I, I work on the, sh on, the, on the clams mostly, but, you know, this looks like a pretty worn down part of a mammoth tooth to me. Now, um, are there any fossils, uh, I'm sure there are, of, of the um, fish and other things that would eat the, the, the clams? I mean, were there sea otters back then? Um, the sea otters are, are, are fairly recent in the, in the geological record, maybe about a million years ago, okay. are the first sea otters. And so, not right around Santa Cruz, but in other places of the California coast, like down by San Diego or, or up in Oregon, there are sea otter fossils. What are some of the, the uh, predators that would have been hunting these in, invertebrates? Uh, well, invertebrates? so there, 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 were, there would have been, um, you know, potentially the, the walruses might have been eating clams, like, I think, well, you know, like they, they do today. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some of the, you know, the seals or sea lions, you know, they would eat fish as well. Um, there were fur seal fossils around here and, and, and ancient sea lions, and also fishes. You know, there would have been, you know, probably... You know, the fish fossils, surprisingly enough, fish, you know, fish don't fossilize that well. You know, partly if you've ever eaten fish, you know their bones are, are quite, quite thin and, right. and, and, and fragile. So it's, it's in places like, you know, around Monterey or in Santa Cruz where you get these, these layers that were formed when the oxygen levels of the water were, were fairly low. And so the fish, if it sinks down, will, will get preserved there. And so the Monterey, so there's, there's this unit called the Monterey Formation, which is like a, a bunch of rock layers. And it's, it's 
well, you know, fairly well known for for fish fossils, like the last caller was was mentioning, how he found some down in the Carmel Valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone sent me a picture of a whale being um, uncovered or being you know dug up in Scotts Valley. Those bones are in Scotts Valley. Are, were those placed there? Was that underwater? Those, those have been there. Um, yes, or, or did the land yeah. rise and, and bring them up? So it's mostly the land rising. I mean, so the, those ones, you know, would have been. I actually don't know which rock unit that's in, but they're they maybe, say, 5 million years old or 10 million years old. You know, and that, at that time, sea level might have been 20 or 30 feet higher than it is now. Mm. Um, but it would not have been, you know, Scotts Valley is a couple hundred feet elevation. And so it's most of the land has risen up in this area. That's the primary reason why you find fossils of, of marine organisms up in the mountains. Uh, DM at KSEO.com. I don't know uh, if you can answer this or not. Somebody says... do. Uh, to ask you, do the poles switch every 11,000 years and, and and then we have an ice age? I mean, is there any uh, evidence, uh, fossil evidence of the poles switching? Um, what, do you have any answer so, for that? So certainly the, the Earth's magnetic poles, so the reason that if you use a compass, it points towards the north, those flip not every 11,000 years. They flip sort of irregularly, but maybe every million-ish years or, or more. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been, you know, over the last several million years, many ice ages, and those happen on a, on a, you know, around every 100,000 years, and that has to do with the, the wobbles of the Earth's orbit causing very subtle changes in the sunlight that comes from the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and then there's, there's, it's a quite complicated chain of events that, that cause all of this. But, but, yeah, I mean, the Earth's orbit does cause very small changes in, in climate that can ultimately cascade into bigger things. Four seven nine one zero eight zero two one eight five seven two six. We're getting ready to head to a break, uh, Professor Clapham. When we get back, though, I do want to talk about mass extinctions. This is something uh, Jack and I were talking about earlier. Um, pretty fascinating, you know. Um, how close ha- has um, life gotten to just being wiped out? And how how many mass extinctions? Uh, just a short answer because we only have two minutes here before we're right. at the bottom. How many mass extinctions are we talking about? So there have been five that are really big. And then, you know, sort of a spectrum of, of extinction beyond that. But sort of five famous mass extinctions. Okay. All right. We'll hold it right there. We'll talk about it on the other side. Professor Clapham, uh, Matthew Clapham, he is uh, an instructor up at UCSC. If you want to find out more, how do we find out more about your classes and uh, how to enroll? That's a good question. I mean, I suppose... Um I don't actually don't know how that works. <laughs> okay, we'll find out and we'll let them know. In, in, in the meantime, just go ahead and, and stretch your legs. We're going to take about a seven-minute break or so, and then we'll be back on the other side. All right. All right. Uh, Professor Clapham, thank you for joining us. What do you think, Jack? You having fun, dude? Oh, yeah, dude. This is great, man. Oh, yeah. This is fantastic. I love it. I've been getting lots of comments on our emails and text messages. This is fantastic. If you have any questions, send them in. He's going to be here for another half hour. In the meantime, we're going to take a break for news. You're listening to KSCO, serving King City, Mount Hermon, and Chular. Seven nine one zero eight zero. You're listening to Flight 1080 KSEO Santa Cruz. DM at KSEO.com. 218-5726-831, of course, is the area code. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Subscribe and like us. 536 is the time. We're speaking with um, Professor Matthew Clapham. He is a, a teaches up at the university, UCSC. And uh, when we left, we were just about to get into mass extinctions. Professor Clapham, again, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, yeah. Okay. So when we went to break, you mentioned that there was five mass extinctions. Now, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. These must have been pretty gnarly. Um, how close were we... In each situation, was was life on the verge of being wiped out? Well, life itself, no. Bacteria, you probably can't kill all the bacteria on Earth. It would take something probably destroying Earth itself. Um, Mm. In terms of animal life, 
you know, the, the Permian extinction is maybe the, the closest, you know, maybe 90% of the species went extinct. It's, it's hard to know the exact number because we really only know the species that had shells or, or bones or teeth. We don't know about all the worms, you know, how many of them survived. Um, it's probably hard to kill off life on, on Earth. I, I think that it's not like it was, you know, within a whisker of, of animals dying out or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very severe, but life is pretty, life is pretty tough. What was the common factor? Is there a common factor in all of them? I mean, was it disease? I mean, humans, uh, probably uh, to a very small extent, disease, uh, global warming? Uh, yeah, I mean, so... Environment change? Of, of the five, you know, f- there are definitely two that were caused by sort of rapid global warming. One by, a, by an asteroid impact or meteorite impact. One is less well understood, but there was definitely the oxygen levels in the ocean went down. It might have been related to, to warming. And then one was caused by, again, sort of climate, but there was a rapid sort of ice age and then warming event. And this is the very first mass extinction of almost 500 million years ago. Uh, did, did disease play any part? Could, could we tell if disease played a part? I mean, is this something we can tell by looking at fossils? It would be hard to tell. Um, you know, most diseases that might kill an, an animal are not going to change its bones um, you know, or or its teeth. The only way of possibly telling could be done with very recent fossils from the last, you know, tens of thousands of years where it might be possible to actually get the DNA from, say, the teeth and find the DNA of a disease, like a bacteria, like the, you know, plague or, or whatever. There's this, there is increasing work done on what's called ancient DNA, where you can get DNA from mammoths, for example, from, you know, from, that are 20 or 30,000 years old. But it would be still difficult to know, you know, if there was disease that was killing them. Four seven nine one zero eight zero two one eight five seven two six. Before we get out of here, we have we have just over twenty minutes left. You mentioned that around this area we had yes clams and, and other things like that, but you also mentioned that by the lighthouse they discovered um, a walrus skeleton. I know they found a a, um, a skeleton, or at least a partial skeleton of a whale or dolphin closer to Jack O'Neill's house. Uh, a sea cow type creature was found somewhere around here apparently too. What are some of the other really cool um, marine animals that, that have been discovered around this area? So, yeah, I mean, there's been a couple of, of sort of sea, fur seals and, and sea lions, um, you know, that are, a few, you know, five, three to five million years old. A number of whales um, and dolphins, you know, yes, definitely like Pleasure Point, there have been a couple whales that have been, whale or dolphins that have been found, mm-hmm. Capitola area. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of, of that, you know, and also shark teeth, the, the famous megalodon shark, you know, the biggest shark that ever lived. Right. Um, some of its teeth have been found near here. Wow. Like in, you know, in the cliffs of Santa Cruz. Wow. What did they eat? Well, they probably ate whales. I mean, they're they're really big, so they probably ate small whales and, and dolphins, and and you know maybe seals or walruses as well. Wow, four seven nine ten eighty two one eight five seven two six DM at KSEO dot com. Any thoughts, Jack? Yeah, I this is maybe seems, uh, Professor. Maybe it's a little too uh, I don't know what you want to call it, kind of fanciful. But I've always wondered why why do you think people are so fascinated with um, you know, life as it existed 100,000, 200,000, a million years ago, specifically like big, you know, everyone likes to talk about the megalodon or the megafauna. That seems to be what people are so preoccupied with. Do you have any thoughts about why that human beings seem to be so fascinated with that? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, partly it's just that these things, some of these things are, are like, uh, you know, weird and unlike things we have today. For, for you know, for people who grew up in, you know, North America or, or Europe, you don't really see big animals that often. I mean, we, you know, I see deer a lot on campus, but you don't see like, you know, elephant sized things or bigger than elephant sized things. So I think, you know, size is obviously something that's kind of awe inspiring. These, these enormous animals, dinosaurs being, you know, I suppose the, the best example of something that's just like really, you know, different and huge and really, you know, unlike anything that we're used to seeing. Do you think, um, Professor Clapham, that there is any any um, any hint uh, th- that we're fascinated by the, these 
these uh, fossils. Do you think there's any kind of neener, neener, neener? I made it. You didn't. <laughs> um, I, I'm here. I'm the ultimate. I'm the apex uh, predator. You might have been at that time, but, uh, you know, you can just kiss my grits because I'm mm -hmm. here on top now. Do you think there's any kind of, of that? I mean, I suppose there could be, you know, I'm sure, you know, people, you know, probably like fossils for a variety of, of reasons. You know, there's many people and many people like fossils. And it's not, that's not necessarily a reason that resonates with me, but I'm sure people could, you know, look back and, and you know, I suppose feel a little, um, you know, um, sort of, yeah. Tough. Guilt, guilty pride or pride. And like, yeah, we, we made it, you know, yeah. you didn't. Four seven nine ten eighty two one eight five seven two six. What are some of the smaller animals that that you that we have fossilized around here that, that are no longer around? So the megalodon, you know, those those are bigger right, animals. Right. Uh, what are some of the smaller ones? Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of the vertebrate animals, there are there are fishes. There's a, a something called the saber toothed salmon, which is you know, wow. it, which is slightly bigger than today's salmon. It had these weird like tusks that kind of poked out of its its mouth, um, and some of those have been found by in, in Moore Creek on the west side of Santa Cruz, town of Santa Cruz. Um, there are some fossil birds, you know, from areas around Santa Cruz, uh, which would be fairly small. And then, you know, although you can't see them with, with your eye, many of these, the rocks that you see around Santa Cruz are going to have, you know, microscopic fossils of, of single-celled plankton and, and things like that, which, you know, would, would, in fact, some cases make up most of the rock. If you're down by Monterey, this Monterey formation is actually mostly made up of the shells, you know, little tiny shells of little single-celled creatures. Are there any creatures that you look... And I don't know if you're religious or not. I, I am not, but, you know, I, I've been reading the Bible. And, um, I, I would like to find out the answer, but anyways, when I, when I look at life in, in the ocean, I think, holy smokes, this makes no sense. All the animals out there, just different varieties, just blows my mind. Are there any creatures that you have found fossilized that you said... I can't believe that ever existed, or no wonder why it went extinct. That's a dumb design. <laughs> Is there any, anything like that that you've seen out there? I mean, there's some, you know, I mean, there are certainly some weird-looking things. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, maybe they, you know, often things go extinct not because they're sort of bad, but because the conditions change, and they, mm. used, to be, they used to be sort of well-suited for where they live, but then things changed, and they were no longer, you know, able to withstand those conditions or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, so you know, there are some you know sort of weird and unusual looking things as, as fossils, but also today, I mean, the, the the range of things that live in the ocean today that are you know live in the deep ocean or or just even in the shallow waters that people are not as familiar with is there's, there's a huge variety of things. Now, if if uh, there's these geologic changes going on and these climate changes going on. Um, did I read something? Did I hear that word here, Jack, transmorphing? What was that word that you said? Oh, morphology? Uh, morphology, yes, uh, morphology. Is, this, is that where this comes into play, Professor? Morphology, well, what is morphology? So morphology is just sort of the shape of the animal. You know, mm -hmm. does it have big horns or does it have, you know, is its shell long and thin? So morph yeah, it just sort of describes how it looks and how it appears, and its shape. Is, is, is that as a result of, of the environment that it's growing in? I mean, is this similar to, to what we commonly think as evolution? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, many, for many, um, you know, both land animals but also marine animals, you know, they will evolve, a, you know, over time, evolve a shape, and that shape often relates to, you know, for clams, you can actually tell from looking at the shell if you, if you know about the morphology, like, did this clam burrow in the sand or did it live on top of the sand and it attached to the rock? You know, so, so in many cases, the, the shape of the shell relates to sort of the lifestyle of the organism. Hmm. 218-5726, if you want to send in a text message, that's 218-KSEO. Here's a question for you, uh, Professor. What does he think are the chances that there could have been invertebrate uh, megafauna, like some sort of jar uh, gargantuan jellyfish that would not leave fossils? So, that's, I mean, so that's, there's two interesting points there. In terms of things like jellyfish or giant squids, you know, giant squids are very large. You know, they can be, you know, 20, 30 feet long, you know, more if you include like, the tentacles they would not really leave a fossil record except in extremely unusual situations. You know, in terms of invertebrate megafauna, some of the biggest things that we know of 
there was this relative of sort of squid and octopus that lived, you know, four or five hundred million years ago, and it had a shell, a big cone shell that was, in some cases, 15 or 20 feet long. So, you know, that's in terms of megafauna for invertebrates. There are these things called sea scorpions, which lived, you know, 300 million years ago. And some of them could be, you know, 8 or 10 feet long with big claws and probably wouldn't want to wouldn't wanna run into them if you were snorkeling. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. We're here with uh, Professor Clapham. I am having so much fun, Professor. Um, maybe I should take, I, I got to take, um, I would love to take one of these courses, History of Life. Um, one of the courses that you teach. What are some of the qu most, more popular questions that you get from your students taking that course? Yeah, you know, it's often, it's often fun, the questions that students come up with, because they have, you know, maybe a different perspective on things from other, you know, classes they've taken or from their, their life experience. Um, yeah, what, I'm trying to think of one that kind of jumps out as, as, as interesting or, you know, especially un unusual. You know, students often ask, one thing which often comes up is like, well, if there's a mass extinction, why don't we see just like layers of bones there from everything dying? Mm. You, know? no, that's, you might think okay. like, you know, right, it, it makes sense. Like if you kill yeah. off all the dinosaurs, like why are there not just like bones everywhere? Sure. And, and right, intuitively it sort of makes sense. But if you think about it, how long do like deer live today? You know, maybe a deer will live to be 10 or 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So all the deer that are alive in Santa Cruz today are going to die in the next 10 or 15 years. But how often do you see deer bones outside? You know, almost never. So that's kind of the thing. Mass extinctions, even though a lot of things die, it's actually not much more than what would normally die. It's just that it's a slightly quicker rate and bones decay pretty quickly. So uh, that's one that comes up often because it makes total sense. But in, in reality, you don't get giant bone deposits from mass extinctions because it's not actually that much faster rate of dying it's just slightly enough and it happens over a few hundred or you know ten thousand years and over that time you can kill off a bunch of species what is the most likely scenario for a modern day mass extinction and who would be the the winners and who would be the losers right well you know i think that there has been to some extent a mass extinction because of all these megafauna you know the mammoths and the the, the bears and everything, and I mean, in the current extinction, things that are big tend to be at risk. And that's because the current extinction on land and in the oceans is largely because of, you know, habitat destruction and overfishing or overhunting. So in the ocean, you know, tuna, like, you know, the, the big tunas you know, are, are at risk. Sharks, because big things tend to be caught more easily, tend to have you know, take longer to reproduce as well. So today, if you're big, it's not good, and smaller things tend to be doing better. How would humans fare if, if just in Well, this we'll probably be fine because we're the ones that are causing the extinction, so we're unlikely to kill ourselves off. You never know, you know, there could be a... But in terms of humans, we live everywhere, so that helps you survive an extinction. If you live only in one place, there's a much greater risk. You know, if something just... If humans only lived in Santa Cruz, you could imagine that, you know maybe a big tsunami could kill us all at once or, you know, an earthquake or something. But because we live everywhere, we're somewhat more protected. Does the ocean provide any layer of protection for, for uh, you know, for, the animals in there? Yeah, I mean, the ocean is a bit more stable of an environment. It's, it's harder to make quick changes. You know, on land, you can get droughts and you can get, mm. you know, really wet years. And so it's a bit more, there's a bit more possibility for sort of, you know, quick changes that can kill things on land. So, so probably the ocean is a bit more stable and, and protected of, a, of an habitat. What are some of the biggest threats to the ocean? Well, today it's really, you know, for many organisms, it's, it's you know, overfishing, you know, put out these big nets and it catches the things you want to catch, but also it catches sharks and, and other fishes and dolphins and, and whatever. Um, there's also, you know, because of carbon dioxide release from, fossil fuels and everything, the oceans are becoming more acidic. And we know in geological events in the past that that has often caused extinctions. Whether it will today, is we don't know, but it has been something in the past that acidification and also ocean warming has been associated with mass extinctions. What would have caused the acidification uh, pre-human? Yeah, it's a good question. So it was carbon dioxide as well, but it was carbon dioxide from these really 
big and weird volcanic eruption. So, so kind mm-hmm. of imagine like Hawaii, but the size of the U.S. and happening over only a few thousand years. So these happen extremely infrequently, which is good. Um, but when they do happen, they're, they're called flood basalt eruptions because basalt is the type of rock that you find in Hawaii, for example. And they sort of kind of flood out over continents. And they're often associated with sort of the splitting of continents into two. And they release large amounts of carbon dioxide very quickly in a geological sense. And that's what causes these ancient events, probably. Okay, so that's bad, right? Yeah, it, it was. It's been bad, especially if you're a coral reef. In the past, uh, it's been. It has not been good for them. Four seven nine ten eighty. Let's get to another phone call. We are speaking with Professor Matthew Clapham. He is a professor up at UCSC, and he's been spending the last hour and a half with us. And I, I am just so thrilled, uh, Professor, to have you here. David is up next. He's calling from Ben Lomond. You're in the air, David. Hey guys, great show. Um, it's my understanding that uh, vertebrates. Um, evolved from sea creatures originally, but it's also my understanding that whales and dolphins uniquely uh, evolved back into the ocean from a uh, common from common land uh, vertebrates, and somehow it's easier to accept that we learn to breathe from uh, being in the water uh, or becoming terrestrial than it is to imagine going back into the water and losing legs. I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit in in regards to whales and dolphins. Yeah, that's absolutely right, that that whales and and dolphins evolved from from land ancestors that were related to pigs and and hippos, actually. Um, There's been a number of events where things have moved back into the ocean, starting with in the, you know, 250 million years ago, these things called ichthyosaurs, sort of like dolphin-like reptiles, um, you know, and, and mosasaurs that evolved from snakes. So, so it's happened a number of times, probably maybe more, even more than 10 times. Um, it's an interesting situation. Like, why, why does it happen? Like, why go back to the ocean? Um, in, in some cases, or in, in a number of cases, it seems like it, it happens after these mass extinctions. So in, in the case of whales... Potentially, you know, there's all the things, that, all the big animals living in the ocean before were pretty much killed off, except for the sharks, and then whales sort of took over afterwards. There might, you know, be as long as you can, you know, evolve that, and it happens in stages. You know, starting by swimming in the rivers a bit, and then you know, moving more into the oceans. The early whales, in fact, weren't really ocean dwelling. They lived sort of in coastal environments. Professor, can I add something to that really quick as well? Mm-hmm. There's a species of iguana um, that has been, uh, you, they're uniquely vegetarian and they live on a, a fairly desolate volcanic island and they, they feed on algae primarily. And it's a really interesting behavior because you'll see them sun themselves and then they jump into the water and they're very... Uh, agile swimmers and they'll swim down to the bottom and they'll rip algae up you could even say uh, David that that's kind of an example of of a behavior that might lead to an animal developing more traits so the Uh. one of the traits that benefits them is having these long tails that so they're better able to um, swim through the water against the current so that trait would then be uh, encouraged for lack of a better word Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of in my instinct that probably food supply would be the thing that would push us back into the ocean, but it's just kind of a guess. Uh, just one more thing. Uh, the Permian age is my favorite age of animal, where everything was uh, largely, you know, somewhat half mammal and half reptile combination hybrid before we split into mammals and reptiles after the extinction there. And I was wondering, I haven't looked into this, I'd love to see fossils of Permian uh, animals as far as they exist, which must, must be much more rare than dinosaurs. Is there anywhere near, nearby-ish that uh, any kind of type of museum or institution that has uh, Permian fossils? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there, there could be most of the Permian rocks that would have those fossils are quite far from here, like Texas has in you know, Oklahoma. So I know museums in Texas have a lot. You know, maybe the, the, does the Cal Academy, I, I would guess that they probably don't have any on display because it doesn't really relate to sort of local um, ancient life. But I'm not, you know, not entirely certain. The L.A. County Museum 
might. It's been a while since I've been there. Thank you for your call, David. Four seven nine one zero eight zero. We have enough time for one more call. We're heading out to Salinas. Lean has a question for you, Professor. Lean, thank you for your call. You're in the air. Hi, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. One is, why? What is it? I've wondered this for a long time. If evolution has created what we see today, why don't primates, for example, continue to evolve? Why don't we see primates? develop into a more sophisticated form of an animal closer to a human more so and more so that's one question the other question was when you were talking about the scorpion creature under the water that that became extinct once there was a uh, disruption in in nature but why does it evolve downward to a smaller species which is kind of along the same lines as what that last uh, question was regarding is how right. does the size continue to diminish and why and then one more observation i have which is something i've wondered about for a long time is there's something in the plant kingdom called monkey orchids and when you look at those they have the face of monkeys and primates they're astounding they look exactly like a small little monkey and a little flower it's just incredible they have one called the darth vader orchid mm -hmm. and and what's interesting to me is, is that it's almost as if nature or God or whatever has borrowed its sample or its, its template from one species to another because they're so similar. In other words, it's almost like what came first, the plants or the animals? I think it was the plant kingdom, right? There was algae first. I mean, so to get to some of your questions uh, quickly here, um, Humans and, and all animals, animals are actually still evolving. P people can, by looking at the DNA of humans, we can actually see how humans are still evolving. We're not really, you know, evolution is a slow process, so it's not like we're going to grow different hands or anything like that. But genetically, we're still evolving and we're still changing. And also, there's not to say we're not necessarily more sophisticated than other things. Animals sort of, when, when, as they evolve, evolve you know, and things that are useful for what they do are sort of supported and things that are not as useful for what that animal does. And so, yeah, I mean, a clam is not very exciting, but they're very good at what they do. And so they're not really any more or less evolved than, than we are, for example. Thank you for your call, Lane. We appreciate it. Four seven nine one zero eight zero. But we are out of time. Uh, Professor Clapham, I want to again thank you, man. I had so much fun. Can we do this again sometime? Yeah, this was a lot of fun. All right, all right, man. We got to get you back on. I'll email you, and, and we got to talk about evolution. That is one of my favorite things. And I'm so glad that you said humans can.